Good morning, everybody. How are you today? Good morning. Good morning. Well, I uh, am excited to be here, and um, and that's kind of a lie. I'm really not. Um, <laughs> I'll explain. I'm gonna explain. You know, for people who are new to Lifeway, uh, every year the the elders and the leaders they they come up with a word that they believe God wants, that it explains what God wants to teach us as a church this year. Anybody know what this year's word is? Influence. Influence, that's right. Um, last year's word, who knows what 2013's was? It was flourish, right? Flourish. I believe the year before that, the word was empanadas. Um, so if you don't know what empanadas are, just to see the saws, I'd recommend that, and that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, quite well, two and a half years ago or so, I was reading through 1 Samuel, and it was as if God gave me a word. I put a word on my heart, very strongly, sort of in the same way. And it's been a couple of years, and it hasn't gone away. And the word was courage. And that terrifies me. Because I don't want to teach on courage. Because whatever you teach on, God tests you on. And that's sort of like there's some things you don't want to be tested on. You don't want to be tested on patience. <laughs> How many people here has God tested you on patience using me to test you on patience? <laughs> My wife has her hand. Wake up. Um, Courage is not the type of thing that I want to be tested on. So I hope that it went away. But as I kept reading the scriptures, I kept getting that same word back. Courage. 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 And I did not have the courage to ask Juan uh, for permission to, to teach on courage. But then we started in 2014 to, uh, to read through the Bible chronologically. Now how many people are, are doing that? Okay, good. Even if you're not, you put your hand up and you can lie. And, yeah, we're all doing it, right? And it, it's, it's been a blessing. People who are lying, yeah, well, it's been a blessing. Go to the front of the It's been great. Yeah, I didn't know what you were talking about. Um, and as we started getting closer to 1 Samuel, that first passage where I first saw courage so strongly, I felt the prompting of God to say, Mark, it's time to teach on courage. Now, I've been seeing it all over the scriptures, but something about 1 Samuel 17, that's where, I, where God really first showed it to me. And so I went up to Juan and asked him if, if I might, if he would, might consider having me to come and preach on courage for 1 Samuel 17. And I was hoping he'd say no, <laughs> but he didn't. He said yes. So I'm, um, it's, it's with great joy <laughs> that I'm here to teach um, and God help me, because I, I really don't want to be tested on this. But as my wife pointed out to me, we have been tested on courage quite a bit uh, over the last few years, just in the ministry that we have uh, in, on the streets. We've seen a greater uh, presence of, of police activity. We've seen a, a greater um, resistance to the gospel proclamation, even though the proclamation is given in a loving manner. We've seen uh, a hardening of reception. And there have been times where courage has been required, uh, supernatural courage. So with that, it's, it's my, privilege, my privilege and pleasure to bring this to you. I, I have a very simple passage to bring, one that, that is certainly familiar to, to anybody who certainly is a Christian, one that's familiar to people who, even, who don't know the Lord. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, if you have your Bible, please uh, find your way there. It's about halfway through the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament has, has much to speak to us. We don't call it the Old Testament because it's, it's useless. It just is older. That's all. Um, there are lots of things that are older that are useful. I, I give you Bob Crabb as an example. Because <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Because I love you. Okay. <laughs> so 1 Samuel is, is, you'll find your way there. And this is a passage, it's David and Goliath, right? Everybody knows, everybody knows about David and Goliath, right? Uh, you know, you don't have to, even if you don't know the Lord is your Savior, 
even if you, you come from an environment that's not very biblically literate, most of us know about David and Goliath. Perhaps you've seen uh, Larry the Cucumber and Bob the Tomato acted out in Junior Asparagus and however it means. This is not a, an uncommon passage, but what I hope today is that we'll find something uncommon about it. So if you would uh, open up to 1 Samuel 17, Matthew project the first verses of that, I appreciate that. Read along with me. 1 through 11. The Philistines, and understand, okay, I'm going to stop you here. The Philistines were the enemies of God at that time. They were much stronger than the Israelites. God's people were the Israelites. The Philistines were uh, often subjecting them to, to slavery and to uh, different persecutions. And so these were, that's, who the, that's the historical context here. Now the Philistine now mustered their army for battle. I love that word. They mustered their army for battle. I, I, have, I have a charge for all of you. I want you to all try in a sentence this week to use the word muster. That's a great word. So, they mustered their army for battle and camped between Sukkah in Judah and Asakah at Ephes Damim. So here they are, they're in the southern part of Israel. We know that because of the word Judah. Judah is the southern portion of Israel. Uh, great military uh, advantage to being there. Now Saul was the king of Israel at the time. So Saul countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. So you have the Philistines on one side, the Israelites on the other. There is a valley in between. This is a tense situation. Tension in the Middle East is, is not a new thing. Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out of Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. 125 pounds! Just the, the, the chain mail that he wore. He also wore a bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. You know, how did it get hit by one of those? Tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. Now this is just the beginning of the Iron Age. You have the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. So it, the, the scripture says that his spearhead was made of iron. This is the new stuff. This is like, you know, top technology here. Wow. He had an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. I wouldn't want to, that's the spearhead. I wouldn't want to be hit by one of those. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying the shield. So a lot of times when you see David and Goliath, you, know, you got David on one side, you got Goliath on the other, but that's not a complete picture. He had another dude in front of him. He had a, a shield bearer just to hold the shield. Okay, so you got two guys there. One guy with a shield and Goliath nine feet tall. There's different speculations about maybe what kind of conditions he might have had to, to make him that tall. That's not the purpose of, of today's sermon, but certainly uh, we can talk about that uh, offline if you'd like. But he's, uh, he, he's a big dude, and he had other people with him. Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you coming out to, why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Yeah, you think? You think? Terrified and deeply shaken. Yeah, I would be too. I would be too. And this happened for 40 days. 40 days! Imagine every single day, Goliath would come and taunt. And I wonder if that wasn't the worst part, being taunted by a Philistine in the name of other gods. Now, Israel was a military monarchy. So, 
a little bit of test here. Whose job is it in a military monarchy where you have a king, who is the head champion? Whose job is it to go out and defend Israel? The king, that's right. Whose job is it when Saul comes, would someone send a champion? That's easy. Hey Saul, it's you. Dude, you're up. You're the king. You're God's chosen one. And if you read in, in 1 Samuel, Saul's no slouch. He's, no, he's not some wimpy guy. He was strong. He was mighty. That would have been a good fight. Maybe he could have even done it. That's his job. But instead, he spends 40 days cowering like a junior high girl. <laughs> I knew I'd get in trouble for that one. <laughs> no disrespect to my daughters. <laughs> But this is what this is what Saul was supposed to do. This is his job. This is God's man. God set him up for this. This is your this is your chance, Saul. And he didn't do it. So now we enter David. Who's David? We'll, we'll talk about him in a moment. Um, David was uh, so small and young that he wasn't even old enough to go to battle. His his brothers were older. They were at the battle. And so David's father said, you know what, Just, I want to know what's going on, and I want to send them some food and some extra stuff. So David, you, your job is to just bring the stuff to them. I mean, he was so, you know, so young that he wasn't one of, the, one of the soldiers. So he went to the front room, he went there, he traveled, brought some uh, provisions, and he saw what was going on. And he saw this champion taunting the armies of Israel, taunting the God of Israel. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I love, in verse 26, David asked the soldiers standing nearby, because he saw what was going on, so he says, hey, soldiers, he goes, uh, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? What did David want? He wanted to know, this defiance, is, it's got to stop. This is over. And then, this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. He says, who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? In other translations it says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he is allowed to taunt the armies of the living God? I love that. Goliath called himself a champion. You know, the words we, we give things have, has power. But what we believe about things, what did Goliath believe about himself? He thought he was a champion, right? What did Saul think about Goliath? Well, you could tell by his actions. Remember? The, you know, <coughs> these little middle school girl in the 40 days, crying in the fetal position. He thought Saul, certainly Goliath was a champion. Did David call him a champion? No. no. What did he call him? An uncircumcised Philistine. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? And in verse, uh, if you can project verse 31. Then David's question was reported to King Saul. So people start talking about this. I guess, you know, it's pretty easy for word to get around when you're all huddled together like scared little chickens, right? <laughs> then David's question was reported to King Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Can you imagine, this kid who wasn't even big enough or old enough to be in the army, he says, I'll fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by its jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. I love that. I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Who's going to rescue David? That's right. Is it because David say, I'm, I'm so strong, I'm stronger than Goliath? No. It's all about God. He's so Christ-centered. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said. And then he said one smart thing. And, the, and may the Lord be with you. 
Then Saul gave David his own armor, the, the armor of the king of Israel. Wow. A bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. That's like that. You're given the armor of the king. This is, this is the best. And you say, I, I can't, I'm not, I'm not wearing this. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into a shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with a shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. Can you imagine walking down the valley, the valley of Elah? Goliath walked out toward David with a shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. He cursed him by the name of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. And David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, who you defiled. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give your dead bodies to the men and the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. That's pretty brash stuff, don't you think? Wow. You got one champion cursing and calling on the name of his false gods, and you have another one calling on the name of the Lord. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Did he catch up? He quickly ran out to him. Notice the contrast between King Saul and King David. Well, not, I'm sorry, between David and King Saul. Where King Saul quickly ran away from Goliath, David quickly ran towards him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. Now, we have to be careful not to get our theology from vegetables. Or from Precious Moments Bible. <laughs> I love the Precious. Who doesn't love the Precious? It's so cute, right? But this is a violent story. How many of us think, and I won't say from a show of hands, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but you know. How many of us think that Goliath got killed by getting hit with a stone in the head? Okay. Probably a bunch of you think that, right? And those of you who don't? Liars. Okay. But no, watch what the text says. This isn't good. This doesn't play well in the precious moment of the Bible. Okay? The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. That's not what killed him. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. For he didn't even have a sword. <laughs> then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. So what killed Goliath? He's so his own sword, the, the sword that he was trusting in. Wow. So it wasn't, it wasn't the rock that killed him, it wasn't the fall that killed him. His own sword. David cut off his head. Draw that, put it on the wall of your kid's bedroom. Isn't that nice? <laughs> nice Bible story there. But this is God's word. This is God's word. And I, I, I've heard this passage preached many times. Um, I've been to the valley of Elah myself in Israel. I picked up a stone. I'm not certain, but I'm fairly confident that the stone that I picked up was actually the one. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Um, but it is, it's a neat place. It's definitely a valley there. This is a historic event that happened. And a lot of times this, this story is taught as be courageous, overcome your fear, and you can conquer giants. I'm not going to teach this, this message that way. The, the, there's not some truth to that. But I think that 1 Samuel 17 really needs to be taught. The key to understanding it is by reading 1 Samuel 16. See, something happened one chapter before. 
And I want to point that out to you. So remember, who was king at the time? Saul. Saul. Okay, ready to cut that. Because this gets a little complicated. I mean, as politics, sometimes it's complicated. So if you go to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1, do we have that? Is that one of the ones I have to? Yeah. So Samuel, Samuel was the prophet in, in Israel. So he's the guy that God talks to. If you want to know what's going on, you go to Samuel. God talks directly to him. And, and, and it's his job to do sacrifices and to, and to give the word of the Lord to the people. So that, that's Samuel. So this gets a little confusing. So I want to, so that's it. You got that. Samuel got it. That's who that is. And one of the things that Samuel did was God used Samuel to pick Saul as a king. And, and Samuel, sometime in the past, made Saul the king. Now you got Saul. He is the king. Samuel made him the king. But he was not a good king. He, he did not trust in the Lord with his whole heart. In fact, the Lord uh, would actually remove his, the kingdom from Saul. His son would never be king. Normally your son becomes king, and then his son becomes king. And there's a lineage there. This is what's going to happen with Saul, because he was a bad king. So let's go to one chapter before David defeats Goliath. This is what happened. Now the Lord said to Samuel, You have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. Okay, now sometimes the Bible is hard to understand. It can be confusing. So I'll read that again. You have mourned long enough for Saul. This is because Samuel was sad. Because, because Saul was such a horrible king. And he was doing such horrible things. And it grieved him. Does it grieve you when you see people do horrible things? So God says, you know, you, you, you mourn long enough. I have rejected him as king of Israel. In the original Hebrew, what that means is that I have rejected him as king of Israel. Okay, so everybody gets that. Okay? It's complicated stuff. Okay? God himself says, I don't want Saul to be king any longer. I have had enough. How many of you know that God is long-suffering, patient? But that doesn't mean that his patience goes on forever. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have, se I have selected one of his sons to be my king. So God is saying, you know what? I want a new king. This is, we're going to do a duo over here, a reboot. And I have rejected Saul. I'm going to pick a new king. So skipping ahead in this chapter, I mean, for you know, for the sake of time, um, you're welcome to read it. So Samuel obeys God, goes, he finds Jesse in Bethlehem, and boy does he have some of the, the coolest, strongest, mighty sons that you can imagine. I'm talking about strong, handsome men. If you want to know what a strong, handsome, you know, Jewish man might look like for sake of context, well, you're, you're, you're looking at one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you can see for yourself. You know, and all these, these handsome men, and Samuel says, well, certainly this man has to be the king. He sees the oldest son of Jesse. And God says, nope, not him. Uh, okay. And then the next one comes in. Well, certainly this one's got to be it. Nope, not that. Nope. God says to Samuel, not that one. Well, how about this? Look at this one. No, nope, not that way. Well, he sees all of them. And Samuel must be confused. Like, but God told me to go to see Jesse. One of his sons is going to be, hey, Jesse, do you have any other sons? Oh, yeah, one more. We got one more. Um, and he's, he's, he's out in the field. So in verse 11, he said, Then Samuel asked, Are these all the sons you have? Here we go. There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, and he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome, with beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, This is the one. Anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oil he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. I want you to read that again. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Would you repeat that with me? And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. And I believe that that is the key to understanding 1 Samuel 17 is that in 1 Samuel 16, right before, 
David was actually made king of Israel. Samuel, through the direction of God himself, anointed him with oil, which is a, a representation, a picture, if you would, of the Holy Spirit. That's what you do to a king. A king in Hebrew is called uh, uh, Messiah, uh, Messiah. It, it literally means anointed one. And a king is someone that you literally anointed with oil. And so Samuel made David king. Now, this might be hard for us Americans to understand because we have a very strict and, and predictable success, succession of, of leadership. You know, we, we, we vote on a certain day, and then on another day in January, you know, one president steps down, another president steps up, you know, and, uh, and, and it's very defined. And you know when one leader ends and one leader begins. This wasn't always the case in Israel. I mean, here, if you can imagine, we actually have two kings of Israel now. We have one that all the people know, and we have one that God knows, and just a few others, Samuel, Jesse, a couple of the brothers, but for the most part, it was unknown. But in who in God's eyes was actually king of Israel at that time? David. David was. Now David didn't actually, it was like this, this weird period where it actually took many years before David actually physically became king in the sense that everybody recognized him as such. But from that moment, he became king of Israel. He was king. And the Holy Spirit rested powerfully upon him. And then it says in the next verse, Now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. And the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Two kings of Israel, one of the Holy Spirit, and one didn't. Now understand, because I don't want to cause any confusion, this was before Pentecost. In, in, in the Old Testament, before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit would, would rest upon somebody for a time and then sometimes leave. You see it happen on, on Samson, he did amazing things. And upon kings like Saul, and he left. We're in a, I don't want anyone to, to leave today thinking, oh, we, we heard that the Holy Spirit could leave you. No, we live in a time where the Holy Spirit comes and stays permanently and dwells. And not just kings, and not just special people, but everybody who saves and knows the Lord Jesus as your Savior. If you turn from your sins, if you repent of your sins, if you trust in the Lord, you have the Holy Spirit forever inside of you. But back then, at this time, the Holy Spirit came down temporarily and sometimes left. And that's why David can write in Psalm 51, you know, take not your Holy Spirit from me. That's why he wrote this. But I don't want anyone to be afraid that you know, you're going to lose the Holy Spirit. If you truly have the Holy Spirit, you will have the Holy Spirit. Now, we can grieve the Spirit. That's something else. But, 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 but the Holy Spirit is, is yours forever if you truly are saved. That's for you to consider. Now, when we look at this, this, this biblical account of this Philistine champion or uncircumcised Philistine, as I like to refer to him. There were two kings of Israel on that battlefield that day. Saul and David. David really was king in God's eyes, in the eyes that it mattered. The world didn't see him as king. In fact, the world said, what are you even doing here? You don't even belong here, little kid. Get out of here. That's what the world thought of David, right? I mean, didn't we not see that in the text? And David acted with such might, not because David was so powerful, not because David is so great. And I don't want, and the application of this text isn't be powerful and, and great like David and go conquer giants, because we can't do that. None of us are strong enough. The application of this is that David was filled with the Holy Spirit. And God did mighty works through him. The hero of this story is not David, it's the Holy Spirit. There were two kings of Israel that day. One filled with the Holy Spirit who ran up to the giant, and one who wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit who hid like a little girl. I'm sorry, i got to stop saying that. Who hid like someone who hides. <laughs> nice 
there are any brothers or sisters here that have a bed where I can sleep tonight, I would appreciate that. I might be in need. There are two kings of Israel on that battlefield. One acted like it, and one didn't. One was filled with the Holy Spirit, one wasn't. I would be doing a horrible disservice if I told you a nice Bible story and didn't bring it into what it means to us today. The Apostle Peter, speaking under the influence of that same Holy Spirit, wrote in his first epistle, 1 Peter 2.9. So now we jump ahead. 1 Peter is right after the book of Hebrews, after the book of James. 1 Peter 2.9, or you can just look right up there. He's talking about those that stumble because they don't believe, they don't believe God's word and so that they have a bad faith. But Peter says, but you're not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests. Royal. Kingly. Royal. You are royal priests. A holy nation. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Let me ask you, men and women today, has God called you out of the darkness into the light? If you're saved, he has. If you're not saved, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you don't know that right now, if you were to die today, right now, that you would go to heaven definitely with Jesus your Savior, then the message for you is not this. The message for you is you need to come to know the Lord Jesus your Savior. And once you do, you become a royal priesthood. Royal. You become a king. Or a queen. Amen. What kind of king are you going to be? Do you want to be a king like David, who was filled with God's Holy Spirit and ran boldly towards the impending doom? Or do you want to be a king that grieves the Holy Spirit, that believes what the world says? that there's a champion that's against me. What about your problems? Just call them an uncircumcised Philistine. Seriously, because you know, what you, what you believe about something does have influence. You can give something a lot more strength than it has. You can give something a lot more strength than it has. Which king will you be? David, I love David. He was so humble. He could have taken over the army of Israel. When, the, when, when, when back to 1 Samuel, when, when this whole thing ended, um, I didn't intend to say this, so. Uh, What do you call that place where you put horses when they're not out? A, 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 what's it called? No, not pasture. It's, it's a wooden structure. Not a stable. What's not a barn? A stall. That's what I'm doing now. Stall. 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 Um, a stall. A stall is an interesting thing. It's a stall. Um, <laughs> so David cuts off his head. I didn't. So I, I didn't intend to share this part. So that's why I'm stalling a little bit. Um, and this is really small text. Have you seen this? I'm like 40 million years old. It is hard for me to read these this tiny little print. I need to get a big Bible. I need to get like a Juan Sa Bible. Look at this thing. How spiritual is that guy? All right. <laughs> Um, so Dave, David uh, took the, the Philistine's head, and uh, you know, and, and, and this is really where um, David could have taken over the armies of Israel. He could have made himself king at this point, but instead he said, "I am the son of your servant Jesse." He showed humility to Saul. 
He showed great humility to Saul. In fact, when he had an opportunity to kill Saul on a number of occasions, he would not do it because David was humble, meek. Um, but also, David, one of the things I love about David is that he was determined. He ran up towards Goliath, didn't he? Didn't he run up to him? And he was... It's okay to be angry. But we need to be angry, brothers and sisters, about the right things. If we love children, we will be angry about abortion, won't we? Why? Because we love children. If we love the Lord Jesus and love the name of the Lord our God, we'll be angry about blasphemy, won't we? If we love purity, we will be angry about pornography, won't we? King David was angry at Goliath. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? That, that, that challenges the name of our God. And it's okay to be angry, as long as we're angry about the right things, and in the right way. There were two kings of Israel in the valley of Elah. Which one will you be? Which one will you be? Because things are getting tough out there. I'm not one to read my Bible in one hand and the newspaper with the other. I don't want to be one of those people. But we do need to be wise about the times. Um, how many people know who Phil Robertson is? Everybody puts their hand. They all know who he is, right? He's uh, the, the dude with the long beard, you know, from Duck Dynasty. So they asked him a question about, uh, about, about homosexuality. And they asked him a question uh, off topic. He was not representing his network. He wasn't even representing his show. They asked him an honest question. He gave an honest answer. One that most people in this country agree with. And what happened to him? Was fired, right? Now eventually that was overturned, but still, he got fired for expressing his opinion, one that was based in Judeo-Christian roots. He got fired for that. Anybody heard of the show, uh, or anybody heard of the, these names, David and Jason Benham? This happened in April of 2014. Jason and uh, David Benham are twins. Uh, they were contracted to start a TV show with HGTV called Flip It Forward. So these are people that you know buy houses and, and you know they make them nicer and then they, they sell them real quick and they make a lot of money. And they were going to make a reality TV show out of these guys um, called Flip It Forward and it was going to be really interesting. And they were asked again uh, in an interview off the record, not, you're not representing HGTV or anything, what your opinions are, because these, these two men are evangelical Christians, they believe in the Bible, and they were asked about homosexuality, and they said, well, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman, that's the way God made it, I'm not for, we shouldn't get, kill gay people, and that's, you know, none of that, gay people, we, we love gay people, we, we treat them with respect and honor, so we treat anybody with respect and honor, but marriage is, is a man and a woman. So their show was canceled for that, for them saying that, before it even started, and then get this, the, remember, they, 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 the reason they got the show was because they were experts at flipping houses and they made lots of money for it and they, this is what, what their business was. Well, the bank that they worked with took away their preferred status as a result. And now they couldn't get the, the, the rates that they used to get and it actually greatly hurt their business because they came up publicly with something that was unpopular in the United States of America in 2014. Who's heard of Brendan Eich? He is, uh, was one of the uh, founders of, of the Java programming language. You know that annoying little pop-up that says your Java's up to, not up to date? You never click on that. A lot of times that's a virus, by the way. But that's a whole other story. But Java runs a lot of your things. This guy is a growing guy, and he was, uh, he was uh, placed in, in April of 2014 as the CEO of the Mozilla Corporation. They make the Firefox web browser and they do a whole lot of other technical services. And it came up that in 2008, he supported a ballot initiative in California to protect traditional marriage, which, by the way, was the exact same position that the President of the United States, current President of the United States, took at the time. So because he supported a ballot initiative and gave some money, a few thousand dollars, to protect traditional marriage, on April 3rd, 2014, he was forced to resign as CEO of the Mozilla Corporation. Not because he was a bad CEO, 
Not because he wasn't smart, but because he took a position that the majority of people in the country took, but was against what the trendy people want you to think. April 2014, Somalia born Ayan Percy Ali was to be given an honorary doctorate at Brandeis University. Now, who is she? Uh, she's not a Christian, but she is uh, uh, someone that we should look up to. Um, she uh, is a former Muslim. She is a critic of how women and girls are treated under Islamic law. She's a woman's rights hero. She uh, co-authored a documentary uh, about what life is like as a woman and a girl under Sharia law. The, the, the man that she made the documentary with was found murdered in England. And she's been on the run. And she's a hero. And they were going to invite her and give her an honorary degree at, at Brandeis University. A Jewish university. Well, the, the Islamic group at Brandeis, I, to me, it, it blows my mind that Brandeis has an Islamic group. But they said, we don't want her to come and speak here. And so they, they canceled on her. And said, okay, you can't come and speak. The, the Muslim students objected, and she was canceled. How's that for tolerance? Does that sound tolerant to you? And if you want something a little closer to home, a little sooner, how about six days ago? On August 18th, 2014, six days ago, in New Bern, Tennessee, Kendra Turner, a high school senior, just started the school year, and she got herself some in-class suspension. She got suspended, got in trouble, had to spend time with the principal. That goes on her record as a senior. You know what she did that was so horrible? Somebody sneezed and she said bless you. But that was written on the board as one of the phrases that you are not allowed to speak in this class. You are not allowed to say bless you. She didn't even say God bless you. She said bless you. And she got suspended for that. Yep. The teacher said that religious talk is not allowed. In the Bible, this wasn't in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> this was in New Bern, Tennessee. My goodness, New Bern, Tennessee. The days are coming, if they're not already here, when we're going to need great courage. It will cost you your job to be a Christian. It might cost you your marriage. It might cost you your career. It might cost you your life. I fully expect to get arrested someday, soon, for, for sharing the gospel of Christ in Boston. And God help me that I will have the courage that if I am filled with the Spirit, then I can be a king who can do that. What kind of king will you be? Students, will you stand up in your class? I'm not, I'm not saying be a obnoxious jerk. Okay? My good friend, Wes Nevis, who actually is here, he said something so brilliant to me. I remember, remember we were driving to Boston together, and he, I'm paraphrasing you, Wes, but he said, you know, if, if you get persecuted for being an obnoxious jerk, there's no value in that. But if you get persecuted for righteousness, now that's, that's something. You know, we could be an obnoxious jerk about Jesus, and, and we could get persecuted, but we're being persecuted because we're being obnoxious. I'm not saying be obnoxious. But I'm saying, we need to stand up. God has called us kings and queens. We are a royal priesthood. What kind of king will you be? Will you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Will you not care even about your life? Will you say to anybody, to the police, that you may kill my body, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the God of Israel, the one who told the mountains to go this high and no higher, told the valleys to go this low and no lower, and they obeyed, said to the oceans, you may come this far and no further, and took all the stars and said, go all the places that I tell you to go, and I even want you to make pretty designs, and they obeyed. I will obey him. Amen. And not you, officer. I'm not saying to disrespect the officers. But when the officers start disrespecting the Lord, who, where does our allegiance go? The Lord. Who will we go to? Will we see them as champions 
But will we see them as uncircumcised Philistines? I am calling men and women to be courageous. And it's not me that's doing it. Because I'm not that courageous. I'm just a scared little Jewish kid who's not even five foot six. <laughs> But I know the Lord Jesus is my Savior, and I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And to the best of my ability, I will not believe Him. But when I do, I will apologize. Will you do that? Will we, will we, like the Apostle Paul, say in Acts 20, 24, he says, My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. We have a wonderful news. We're not telling people bad news. We're telling people wonderful news. Turn away from your sin. People are walking towards a cliff of a, that falls into a lake of fire. And we are calling people and saying, turn around. Please, I beg you, turn to life. Turn away from that and turn to Christ. And we're calling people, yes, we're calling sin, sin. But we're calling life, life. In turn to that, we have good news. And for that, people will say, go away. No one wants to hear your stuff. You're, what are you even doing here? That's what they'll say. But we will stand up. And I, from, the, from the, the authority of the Word of God, I'm calling all of you out. If you can hear my voice, what kind of king or queen will you be? God wants champions. Not champions like Goliath. But champions like David, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, who stood up and said, The King of King and Lord of Lord, He reigns. He reigns in my life, and I will not fear Him who kills the body. And that's it. But I will fear Him that can kill the body and send it to hell. I will fear the Lord my God, and I will serve Him with joy. Whatever happens to me does not matter. As long as I can tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. Will you be a king and queen like that? Will you? Please, I beg you, our society needs it, our towns need it, our children needs it, and it glorifies our God. Because we are being called to a time when this is not popular, and we'll be shut out, and we will stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. We will stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and say to Him, we will give allegiance. If you want to be courageous like that, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Do not grieve Him. Fill yourself with psalms and, and, and hymns and spiritual songs. And put Him first in your life. And say, my God, I am so afraid, but by you I can, I, can, I can do whatever you want me to do. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. If you want someone to pray for you, come forward. I'm going to end my message now. My message is over. I'm done. This is the message that, that God has put on my heart for two years. To be courageous. If you want to be courageous too, then when this is done, come forward. I'll pray for you. Someone up here will pray for you. We want to be men and women that don't just talk about Jesus, but stand for him and move forward and run towards Goliath. Because the, the, the hero of that story is not David. It's the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you are a royal king. What kind of king will you be? Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your word. That we can know for sure what you've done in the lives of saints of old. And Lord, we know, based on who you are, that you will be with the saints of today. And I don't know what this world is going to look like. We are not having our, our heads cut off like like Christians are uh, in Iraq. Please bless those, 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 those poor people that are, that are stuck on mountaintops. But God, our country is, 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 is heading in that direction. And there is persecution. And it is true. And it is real. And what will we do? So God help us. We are not strong. We are not strong. We're like little Davids. Small. We've got stones. We don't even have a sword like David. But by you, God, we can do amazing things because it is you who fight for us and it is you who gets the glory. I thank you, God, that you've made us royal ambassadors, royal priests. I pray, God, that we'll be good kings. We'll be like David.
not like Saul. Will you rise up this generation, please, and bring revival. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.